Okay. On behalf of the Department of English, thank you so much for joining us for this event on undergraduate research. Um, as you might know, I'm Dr. Katie Stanitz. I am the undergraduate program manager, and I'll be moderating this panel in which we'll discuss the diverse possibilities for research and creative work in English and how you can get involved as an undergraduate. So what is research in English? The word research, I think, often conjures ideas of like laboratories and beakers and you're wearing a lab coat and experiments. Um, but in fact, scholarly research happens in all disciplines, um, including the humanities. While it might not employ those beakers or use microscopes, um, research in English has its own apparatuses and methods. And so today, um, this panel aims to kind of demystify English research and discuss some of those specific methods. To do so, we have um, some wonderful panelists here today who are going to talk about what research and creative work looks like in their field and how um, undergraduates might pursue it. Um, other panelists here will talk about some wonderful resources for undergraduate research and the kind of logistics of undertaking um, undergraduate research projects. After that, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or um, at the end, you can turn your microphone on if you'd like and ask questions that way. I'm really pleased that we have this all-star lineup here today to talk about different research uh, methods and projects. And so I'm going to introduce each of our panelists before they speak. And I'll start with our first panelist, Professor Karen Winstead. Karen Winstead is the Director of Undergraduate Studies in English, and she will discuss research on literature and literary history. Um, her research interests include medieval literature, popular culture, medievalism, narrative, life writing, gender and sexuality. She has published four monographs, 15th Century Lives, The Oxford History of Life Writing, Volume 1, The Middle Ages, John Capgrave's 15th Century, and Virgin Martyrs, Legends of Sainthood in Late Medieval England. She's also tra translated and edited medieval lives of various female saints, and she's published essays on Geoffrey Chaucer, Marjorie Kemp, and appropriations of the Middle Ages in film and contemporary novels. So thank you so much, Karen, for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for having me. I am delighted to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is um, undergraduate research. When I was an undergraduate way back in the day, I did a senior thesis, and I think it was one of the most rewarding experiences I ever had. Um, doing research really can broaden your horizon and open up worlds, intellectual, intellectual worlds that you would never encounter just simply in your classwork. You do class, you, you take classes, and you um, read the works your professor wants you to read and maybe you do a project um but you know working up your own research project is something special it is you doing what you want to do and pursuing what interests you and following your passions. So, well, if you've done any courses in literature, you all are familiar with the um, with the close reading exercise or literary analysis. Um, so you will have looked at literary texts to see how they work, what issues they engage, how they deal with various literary um, uh, components like character and um, the formal elements. Um, uh, the themes that are um, worked out within their within these works, and doing literary research will take you a step further. You've written papers um, expressing, making arguments of your own about whatever interests you within these texts. And when you do literary research, you go and you find out what other people have said about these works. And you enter into a dialogue, into a conversation with other, with other, with other scholars. You will go and you will read their works. You'll decide, hey, do I agree with these people? Do these people change? Do, do the, does their take my, change mine? Um, do I want to argue with them? Do I want to extend their arguments? And therefore you are producing something that is part of a scholarly conversation around a work, an author, an issue, um, or what have you. So the, this, is a, this is a wonderful way of um, sort of broadening your horizon and, 
and challenging your thinking about a text. Now, there are various ways that you might um, embark on a literary research project. And I'll just give you a couple of hypotheticals so that you can see the um, various ways in which you might um, you might land in a research project. Let's say you were taking a course on Geoffrey Chaucer. I'm a medievalist, so I'll give a medieval example. Late 14th century author, and you are reading The Wife of Bath's Tale. And that is a story by a woman who has been abused by her husbands. It is a story of a sexual assault. Ooh, awful ugh, um, exactly what you would expect of a medieval text. And then your professor happens to mention, oh, well, and Chaucer paid a whopping amount of money to settle off out of court with a woman who accused her him of rape. And you say, hey, that's weird. I didn't know women accused men of rape in the Middle Ages. I thought they were all oppressed victims of the patriarchy. This is really interesting what happened there. And so you go out and you find out about Chaucer's life and you find out how this incident might have shaped his his um his, his literary characters or else you might become really interested in um women's voices in the late 14th century this woman accused Chaucer of right big important dude were there other women who were like that taking you know saying uh, you don't get to do this to me calling them to account did women write about their experience in sexual assault let's find out their writings let's tell their story that is one route into literary research which could take a number of different directions Say you are interested, to bring in another one of my, my passions, um, say you are an ardent reader of crime fiction and you love Agatha Christie novels um, and you are really interested in the golden age of crime fiction um, and you want to learn more about Christie but also more about other authors of her time. So you might go back and you might read contemporary reviews to get a good sense of how she was regarded um, within her own period. And then you might read other texts, other mysteries that don't make it into the, the classics that everybody reads today. The, the, the mysteries that you can't buy on Amazon, but might be available to you if you go to an archive and you look at these texts that are just languishing in, um, in the shelves of a library and you can read them and you can talk about them and you can do a, you can do a study of them. That's another kind of literary research, research in the archives. Um, literary research is wonderful. Um, I feel when I do it, when I write about texts, when I research texts, I'm a little like a detective. I love detective fictions, you know, I said, and I am a little bit like a detective myself, putting the pieces together, getting a fuller picture of something that I am passionate about. Um, and that gives me just a, it's, it's, it's almost like playing a game. Um, it's something that's incredibly rewarding and stimulating. And that's why I always recommend it because it's available to you too. Now, let me say that in your literature courses, you often, unless you've had me, um, do literary analyses. And some of your professors are like me and they have you do all kinds of wild and crazy things that aren't not necessarily a critical essay. And I wanna emphasize that when you do literary research, the you do not have to express your findings only in the standard critical essay. You can learn all about um, Cecily Champagne, the woman who accused Chaucer of rape, and write her story, write a short story about her. You can write a series of poems. You can put together a digital project. Um, you, do, you can blend all of the wonderful different areas of inquiry that my colleagues will tell you about. You can put those together. You can do rhetorical analyses, creative writing, digital projects, and all kinds of stuff that start out as 
an investigation into a from, into a literary text and a question you had about it. So the sky's the limit, and OSU is a wonderful place to help you develop, elaborate, and present in various ways what you um, want to learn and talk about. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Um, I love uh, talking about being a detective because I do feel like that's one of the most fun parts for me about research is like feeling like you get to like the, the process of discovery in that and and find and put in the way that like research is like a puzzle um, bringing those pieces together. So thank you so much. Uh, next we have Dr. Jonathan Buell, who is the Vice Chair of Rhetoric, Composition and Literacy Studies. Professor Buell will discuss research in writing, rhetoric and literacy. He researches and teaches courses on technical writing, scientific writing, pedagogy, technical writing, or technical editing, excuse me, proposal writing, and research methods. He's the author of Assembling Arguments, Multimodal Rhetoric, and Scientific Discourse. His essays have appeared in College Composition and Communication, Technical Communication Quarterly, and Landmark Essays on Archival Research. Also, with Alan Gross, he edited Science and the Internet, Communicating Knowledge in a Digital Age. All right, thanks, Katie. I'm gonna um, share some slides. Let me just get my share up here. And so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this event. I am gonna talk about undergraduate research in writing rhetoric and literacy or WRL. Um, and so first I'll talk briefly, what is WRL? Then share some recent WRL theses, just so you got a sense of the kinds of projects that people have done as, as a thesis level project, though there are other places that one can also do research be outside of the, the thesis um, or the independent study. I'll talk about some of those presentation and publication opportunities that could be a publication opportunity for a thesis or independent study, but it might also be something that you just develop out of a class and then go on to publish. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about ways to get started if you've never really thought about doing research in WRL before. So just a, a quick overview of WRL stands for writing, rhetoric, and literacy. Though, you know, sometimes these fields are, are described in different ways. Sometimes some programs would call it rhetoric, composition, and literacy. That's how we identify our graduate program. That's my position as vice chair or just rhetoric and composition. Uh, different places will reconfigure the name, but we're really looking at these three overlapping areas, rhetorical studies, literacy studies, and writing studies, which is sometimes called composition studies. Popular associations with these different areas, some people talk about composition, they're really talking about or thinking about teaching writing sometimes. That's the popular notion, the, the type of English teacher who focuses on the teaching of writing as that person's primary interest. Um, rhetoric, sometimes gets a bad rap, especially in, in popular culture. It's usually pejorative. That's just rhetorical. It's only rhetorical. It's not serious. Um, however, rhetoric is actually one of the very oldest disciplines um, that we have. It goes way back to the beginning of, of written uh, language, written text, people studying the arts of persuasion. How do we persuade each other? How do we create persuasive text? Um, and then finally, literacy studies. Oftentimes literacy just associated with reading and writing, but it's a, a lot more complicated than that as the students who are in my uh, methods class in writing rhetoric and literacy have learned this term. Um, if we're thinking about these, not just in terms of their popular uh, associations, but disciplinary questions, um, and these are the very broadest uh, disciplinary questions I could come up with, they get much more narrow and, and much more uh, diverse the more you get into a field, but with composition studies or writing studies, what is writing? And that definition has changed certainly over time as we think about the ways that people write, the technologies they use to communicate. Uh, but with regard to in, in relation to that, how have we taught writing or how should we be teaching writing? And that's the kinds of questions that people in writing studies or composition studies take up. In rhetoric, how are people, this is a very large definition and, and people could quibble with this definition, but in the broadest sense, how do people use language to achieve their goals? Um, you can make that more narrow, you can broaden that out. Sometimes people say it's well, it's more than just people, but overall applied language use, let's study it, let's understand how to either make better text or at least to explain the text that we find uh, out there doing work in the world. And then finally, literacy studies, how do people use culturally situated language practices, reading, writing, composing, other ways that we could define that as well to make sense of the world. 
again, these things get very complicated very quickly. This is just a quick bubble chart from when I was talking and explaining literacy, um, this term. We can look at literacy in terms of scholarly definitions, models, metaphors. Um, and this is just kind of the overview of it. As you get into the field, then you need to think about, well, how do I want to study literacy? Do I want to go observe people uh, as they read and write and do things with language in the world? Do I want to interview them? Do I want to record stories about it? There's lots of different ways that we can study it, which is one of the reasons why it could be good to take the undergraduate methods course in writing rhetoric and literacy studies. To, to kind of get back to this diagram, and I've just added one bubble here, the common elements across these fields is that we're talking about people, text, and context of applied language use. That's roughly what WRL is all about. And if you are an undergraduate doing research in this area, you've got lots of places to look for that kind of applied language use. And sometimes it gets described in um, other ways. There's lots of other fields or subfields within WRL or RCL. These fields include or intersect with or are uh, adjacent to many other fields. So if you hear about writing across the curriculum, it's still writing studies or composition studies. We're just thinking about how do we teach writing in context other than English classes? How do we teach writing in a science class or a history class? Writing center studies. How do we teach writing outside of classes altogether in the, the tutoring arrangement or the small writing group arrangement? Community literacy. How do we think about literacy, not just as a classroom practice, but something that's happening in the world? How might we design community and uh, engage projects to facilitate or foster literacy? Technical and professional communication, looking at all of these things, rhetoric, writing, literacy, with respect to workplace issues. Uh, I put digital media and disability studies down here on their own because they are both part of, all, of WRL, but there are also people who study those fields without doing WRL. You can do disability studies and focus on literary analysis, or you can do digital media studies and focus on the digital humanities. But our department is uh, particularly well known for its overlaps between WRL and digital media studies and disability studies, respectively. Um, okay. Some um, recent theses, just to give you a sense of the, the breadth of interest and possibilities here. Um, and these are just the titles, and they're relatively descriptive titles, so you can learn a lot from them. I'll, I'll talk just shortly about this first example, Brittany Trang's thesis, which I directed a couple of years ago. Brittany was a double major. She was majoring in chemistry and in English, and she wanted to do a thesis in both areas, which is very ambitious. She, she did it, did a good job on on both, um, though I know less about her chemistry thesis than the, her English thesis. Um, and what she did was she, and this is when Karen was talking about how you're not just necessarily tied to the standard essay. Her um, chemistry thesis was on solar cell research and she went off and did that work. Her WRL thesis, her English thesis was using um, that work and describing it in different ways for different kinds of popular audiences, making a magazine piece and a graphical abstract. And um, she made a portfolio of what we might call creative writing pieces, but they weren't creative per se. They're, a, a, they're science writing, scientific communication. What about her other research? Um, I know less about all of these other projects, but you can get a sense from their titles uh, that some are rhetorical, rhetorical strategies of uh, the new woman, um, articulating the urban neighborhood, a grammar of gentrification, also a rhetorical study. Uh, rhetorical findings on climate activists, uh, about authoring Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons, a semiotic narrative and rhetorical text. These are all on very different topics that people cared about, right? Looking at uh, issues of, of women's rights, looking at issues of gentrification, looking at climate activism, looking at a video game. I, I, I did not know what A Tale of Two Sons uh, is all about, but it is a video game. But you can bring the tools of rhetorical analysis, ling linguistic analysis, um, to various artifacts. And one of the ways that you get to that is to think about what you care about. What do you want to study? What do you want to understand better? And then you bring the frameworks that we teach in our, our WRL classes to those situations. And sometimes you might want to bring multiple frameworks to a situation. We've got other projects that focus on writing, exploring methods of instructing first year uh, legal writing courses. Um, and yeah, lots of, of diverse topics people finding something they're interesting in, interested in and then pushing it forward through systematic research. Okay. Um, 
This is just a short list of some publication and, and presentation opportunities. Theses are great. And I would encourage you to do, do a thesis if, if you uh, want to do one. I, I enjoy directing theses. As Kara mentioned, they're really very powerful experiences to do independent research, especially say in your, your last year as an undergraduate. It doesn't work out for everybody in terms of the timeline, and that's okay. Uh, but there are also other opportunities where if you want to do research, you could continue to take, say, a class project and push it forward and get it published, which is a its own kind of rewarding learning experience and also uh, a way to gain uh, something to say put on your resume, a publication you can share with your family or with prospective employers. Um, I will bring up some of these and I'll let me paste these into the chat as well um, in case you want to take a look at these links later on. And I'll bring up a couple. So there are a couple of journals that are just for undergraduate research or for undergraduate student and graduate student research. Young Scholars in Writing is just for undergraduates. You go to their website. Um, there's lots of different articles there uh, that people have generated from their undergraduate research work at different institutions. You can see lots of different topics, something on digital storytelling, something on Pro-Choice uh, America's website, or the NARAL Pro-Choice America's website. Um, interestingly, one of our students took one of her projects from English 3379 and got it published. Here's Materiality Matters, How Human Bodies and Writing Technologies Impact the Composing Process. Brittany Haley, uh, one of our uh, students at Ohio State. So this, this is feasible and possible and doable. You just have to want to do it. You have to want to have to want to spend some time working on it. You will need to take your paper and revise it to get it published. You're gonna to need to go through the peer review process with the journal, but it's a rewarding experience. And at the end of the day, you get a credit and you also get your work out there. All this work that you spend so much time on in your classes, you can then take and share with other people beyond your professor or your media classmates. Um, exchanges, you can see a little bit of a different uh, breadth, or I guess maybe focus rather, Journal of Technical Communication, Rhetoric and Writing Across the Curriculum. I think it started out as primarily a technical communication journal back when it started, and then it's kind of branched out to include both rhetoric and, and uh, WAC uh, projects as well. Queen City Writers, hosted by the University of Cincinnati, though it's not just for students at the University of Cincinnati. Um, so it's again, another place where you can publish your work. Um, and then finally, if you want to do the, the presentation route, some of our national organizations, our big national organization for composition studies is called Four C's, College Composition and Communication, and um, or the Conference of College Composition and Communication. And every year they do a undergraduate poster session. Um, and we're a little late at this point. The, the deadline is the 29th of, was the 29th of January. Before that, it was December 14th. But if you're working on a project now or working on a project over the summer, you can think about submitting that for next year. The conference is about to happen. It's next week. It's not so much so fun this year because it's a virtual conference. You don't get to travel anywhere and see a new city, uh, but you still get the opportunity to present and publish your work in a, a poster format. So finally, just getting started, ways to get started. First, just take some WRL classes, talk to your advisor about what classes might be useful, whether they're some of our writing classes like business and professional writing, or whether they are some of the um, uh, introductions to the field kind of classes like the arts of persuasion course, or this next bullet point, take English 3379 methods in writing rhetoric and literacy, because you'll get a broad overview of the three fields much deeper than we did today in our, my very rough uh, review of that Venn diagram. Uh, you get in a, a thorough introduction to the, those fields, but also to the different kinds of methods that are used. We do kind of textual analysis that one would consider um, parallel to literary analysis. We do archival work, which would be parallel to some of the work that um, Karen was talking about. But people in WRL also do observational studies, interview-based studies, surveys. Um, they do classroom-based research. They do work with human subjects. And so we need to think about some of those additional um, issues that are you know, useful to work through in a class setting before you go to plan a thesis or a bigger project. Uh, third, you wanna find a topic you care about. Anything you care about, you can find a way to make a connection to writing, rhetoric, and literacy because every human activity involves language and 
in our current moment, almost every human activity involves language that's brought down into writing in some way, whether that's digital or, or paper, so more and more primarily digital. Um, so if you find a topic you can care about, you can make a connection to writing rhetoric and literacy. And then finally, talk with faculty to see what approach, which field, which advisor would be the best fit for your project. Because you know your faculty members are great resources. We have a lot of disciplinary knowledge. We don't know, we're not experts in every single thing, but we know where to look for information and we can be good guides for you as you start a research project, or at least start thinking about maybe doing a research project. So thank you all very much. I'm gonna stop my share and I'm happy to answer questions at the end when we get to the question and answer portion of the event. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for this wonderful overview of the kind of constellation of interests that come from WRL. I love that you talk about finding what you're passionate about and researching. And for me, um, you know, when students say, what should I research or how do I approach research? To me, it's always saying, well, what what kind of comes up organically for you? What is the thing that drives you? What do you want to know um, and follow that? And so that's, I think, the way that you get the best research projects. Also, our communications team did a little piece on Brittany Haley's publication that I'll drop in the chat in just a second. So uh, second, uh, so our third panelist is Lee Martin, who is a College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor in English. And he's going to discuss a research in creative writing and especially creative writing projects. Lee, Lee is the author of the novels Bright, The Bright Forever, which was a finalist for the 2006 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction, River of Heaven, Quaker Town, Break the Skin, and Late One Night. He's also published three memoirs, From Our House, Turning Bones, and Such a Life, and two short story collections, The Mutual UFO Network and The Least You Need to Know. He's also the author of a craft book, Telling Stories, The Craft of Narrative and the Writing of Life, and a new novel, Yours, Gene, is actually, I think, out now. Is that right, Lee? Awesome. Okay, so um, so however many more novels than I said. <laughs> um, and he is also the co-editor of Passing the Word, Writers on Their Mentors. So thank you so much, Lee, for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Katie. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm here to sort of dispel the uh, belief that writers, creative writers, don't do any sort of research. Uh, you know, that whole myth that we just sit in our lonely little drafty garrets and uh, play with characters in our minds, uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I teach both fiction and nonfiction, and so that means I write novels, I write memoirs, uh, essay collections, um, short stories, et cetera. And the first thing you have to understand about creative writing is that a writer's first obligation is to create a convincing world on the page. Uh, whether we're talking about um, narrative in some form or whether we're talking about a more lyric impulse as in poetry or in the lyric essay, uh, writers have to know a lot of stuff. That's basically what it boils down to. Uh, poets, for instance, uh, create stunning metaphors out of details from, say, the natural world, the scientific world, uh, whatever the case might be. Um, novelists um, have to convince you that the setting of the novel actually exists. Um, so we have to know a lot of things about places. Um, I have found myself in the past um, doing research for novels that have been based on uh, real events. Uh, and I found myself interviewing people who, um, who knew some of the people I'm basing my characters on. Uh, I found myself visiting places uh, from the setting of the book uh, just to drive the streets and to think about what it must have been like for the real people uh, to have driven those streets or walked those streets. Um, I found myself uh, researching all sorts of primary materials such as court records, court documents, um, uh, police files, um, et cetera, et cetera. I've actually seen things I'm not supposed to see um, because they don't tell you in enough time that you're not supposed to open that particular envelope. <laughs> um, 
the other thing I've done is I've uh, I've sat. I remember when I was writing the Bright Forever. Um, I sat with a woman um, who who was a relative of. Uh, one of the women that was an important character in the novel. And she said, you see that table uh, covering over there? Uh, and it was a crocheted uh, table covering. She said, uh, yeah, um, Cleo crocheted that. And Cleo was um, a woman that I was um, writing about in the form of a created character. And just to be able to touch that um, uh, table covering and to think about the woman who made it um, helped me tremendously in the creating of the character that uh, I was putting in the book. Um, the other thing that happens with creative research is um, I find myself often reading a lot of old newspapers, um, even, even if they're not terribly old, uh, even if I'm writing something that's set in the very recent past, uh, just to be able to go back in time and to read newspapers, uh, to know what was going on in the world at that time. Um, but also um, from a more popular culture point of view, to know what movies were playing at the theaters, um, what the fashions were, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've also called upon research librarians quite often um, in doing my own work. Uh, to point me toward the answers to such questions as um, what magazine would of a, wom a woman of this social class been reading in 1845? Um, I have a new novel set to come out in, in um, 2022, which is based upon the true story of um, the first woman who was executed by hanging in the United States. Uh, we often think that was Mary Surratt, uh, the, the Lincoln co-conspirator, uh, when actually it was a woman named Elizabeth Reed uh, from my native southeastern Illinois who was accused and then convicted of poisoning her husband. And she was convict tried and convicted under very dubious circumstances. Uh, so I decided I was going to write a book about, uh, about Betsy Reed. Uh, and what happened to her. And now when you write a historical novel set in 1845, uh, <laughs> you're up against all sorts of research. Uh, not only the, the, the more global concerns, say of, of the politics of the times, et cetera, et cetera, but really, really small things like what, what writing instrument did somebody uh, in a rural setting use in 1845? And so a lot of research goes into the uh, more historical novels that I write. Uh, so what does this look like uh, when we talk about nonfiction and memoir in particular, where you're really kind of delving in, into your own memory of um, a certain span of time from your life? Uh, I have a little writing exercise I use often um, for my students and I ask them to see how many pairs of shoes they can recall wearing when they were children, uh, going as far back into memory as they can. Uh, and then I ask them to choose one of those pairs of shoes and to start a free write with the words I was wearing them the day. And of course, the shoes don't really matter all that much. They're just a little device to get you, uh, to trick you really into telling a story of some significance uh, from your own past. Um, but once you start telling that story, once you step back into your own memory, you're going to have to do a lot of research uh, to, to tell a story from your past. Uh, you're going to have to interview family members. Uh, you're going to have to um, um, look at artifacts such as photographs uh, or um, items that the family members may have collected, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, really all with the purpose of um, uncovering more of the story than your memory can bring to you. Um, so as you take creative writing workshops with our faculty members, uh, you know, you'll start to work on poems and short stories and essays and maybe even get tempted to try a novel. And, um, 
you'll find yourself having to do quite a bit of research in all the ways that, that I've, I've mentioned. Um, we do direct a number of um, senior theses. Uh, I'm directing one uh, this semester. And it's a project, uh, a collection of short stories, all taking place somewhere in the not too uh, distant future after a hurricane uh, has devastated um, the southern part of the United States. And so all of the stories are linked, uh, sometimes through the reappearance of characters, but always through a consideration of uh, climate change and politics. Uh, and so the student who wrote that uh, collection had to really know a lot about hurricanes, first of all, and had to know a lot about uh, politics and uh, economics uh, um, and, and ended up creating this uh, beautiful collection of short stories that um, really has something to show us about our contemporary time. Uh, I've directed uh, memoirs, uh, I've directed uh, collections of essays, uh, collections of short stories and novels. Um, my colleagues in poetry, of course, have directed a number of theses, uh, their collections of poems. Uh, so I guess, uh, you know, just in closing, I'll say that there are numerous opportunities uh, for creative thesis work uh, here in our department. And I encourage you, of course, if you're interested in pursuing something like this to, first of all, just take workshops with a number of our faculty members and, um, really think about um, which, uh, which faculty member might be particularly attuned to the sort of work that you want to do. Um, I usually ask for, if a student wants to do a, a thesis with me, I ask that student to um, give me a project proposal. Uh, let's, let's see what you're thinking about. And then I'll sit down with you and I'll talk to you about perhaps modifying uh, uh, the proposal or, or just making you aware of uh, certain challenges that might be in front of you. Um, and then we'll set up a, a schedule uh, for you to start writing pages and uh, let me read them and give you some feedback and we'll go along that way. And at the end, you'll have, um, you'll have a collection of whatever it is you've decided to collect. Um, so anyway, I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer questions after, uh, at the end of the, of the, of the panel discussion. And uh, thank you for listening. And I hope I have uh, dispelled the rumor that writers don't go out into the world at all. Uh, I think it's a, it's a, my creative process is, is one of going out into the world to gather material to bring back to the writing space. Thanks all for listening. Thank you so much, Lee. I think you have certainly dispelled that myth. And I love what you said about how it isn't just about imagination, that like imagination in the writing process has to be grounded in that research, that the research shapes it and gives it that real sense of verisimilitude and in, in driving the streets of somewhere or in like the tactility of something that this character made themselves. And so to me, you certainly have that is, um, as a non-creative writer, I found that really fascinating. And so thank you for telling us more about that process. Uh, all right, so our next panelist is going to talk a little bit about the kind of, and, and actually Lee gave us a wonderful transition to this about consulting with library um, subject specialists. So with us, we have Jennifer Schnabel, who is an assistant professor in the University of Libraries. She's going to discuss resources um, in the University of Libraries for um, undergraduates and researchers. She's the subject librarian for English and the liaison, li liaison librarian for film studies and linguistics. She has 15 years of teaching experience, including library instruction sessions and credit bearing writing and literature courses. Her research interests include crime fiction and popular literature. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you for organizing this session and for inviting me. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, here we go. I just created one slide with some of the information that I'll talk about today. And um, Katie, if you could, do you have the PDF that you could put in the chat as a takeaway? That might be helpful as well, um, just so people can keep it handy um, in case you don't remember everything that I said. So yes, I'll, um, I'll drop it in the chat right now. Awesome. So 
I really just wanted to introduce myself so you can see me and know that I'm here uh, to support you and um, talk about the ways that uh, the library itself can support your research as an undergraduate and especially as an English major. So um, I'm probably going to use some examples probably from Karen's talk uh, and from Jonathan's and from Lee's. So I'm really glad that I'm you know, fourth in the program because I'm able to just kind of use their examples to echo what they were saying. Um, so I just have a list of um, things that I can help you with. And first I wanna preface it by saying, you can write me and ask me anything about the library, anything about research, there's no question too small. I want you to feel comfortable to do that. So please do. Um, but here are some other things that I can help with that maybe you didn't realize at first. Um, so I can help you uh, with identifying a research topic and a scope for papers, projects, and theses. So I'm just another faculty member here on this campus that can support you in this way. Um, so just you know, use me as a resource as well. I can help you with finding, accessing, evaluating, and integrating resources, and also discovering the scholarly conversation. So using Karen's example of Chaucer, what, what are scholars already saying about this woman who accused Chaucer? What can we find out about the existing scholarly conversation or the existing conversations elsewhere too? Um, so I always try and help students think about that wider conversation. So sure, peer review articles, but um, I think it's really interesting to look at, you know, cartoons or, um, you know, newspaper um, accounts or anything like that and maybe not so much with Chaucer but with something else so things that maybe wouldn't necessarily come into that oh I need three peer-reviewed sources for this paper and then we're done for some of these larger projects you really will need to look at that overall conversation the scholarly conversation is just part of it um, finding resources it is not easy to do uh, we have a lot of databases and journal subscriptions uh, in the library so i can help you navigate some of those um, because it is a little bit frustrating to do it on your own so please you know feel free to reach out about that um, access is really important um, there are ways that we can get materials and i can talk to you about interlibrary loan article express uh, we might be able to even purchase something um, that might be useful for your research. So it's the kind of um, the kind of opportunities that um, English majors can have if you just come and talk to me and tell me what you're interested in doing. Um, exploring and selecting research methods and presentation tools. So this goes off of what Jonathan was saying and also Karen, um, that it doesn't have to be just the traditional analytical research paper that you're interested in, in using to present your research or even to um, conduct your research. So different re research methodologies. Um, we have in the research commons, we have someone that can consult with you on IRBs. Um, this is the kind of thing that your professor would guide you. And then I can also help connect you to the right people um, to get advice on. Um, Presentation tools, if you want to do a digital project, uh, we have um, experience doing some of those and guiding some of those in the library. So I can talk to you about some of your options. And again, to echo what Jonathan was saying, I do, I am not an expert in everything. However, I'm very persistent and I know a lot of people and I know how to connect you to the resources that you need. So I'm always willing to find out if it's something I don't know. And I'm always trying to learn more about these research methods and presentation tools so I can pass that information along to, um, to students and also to faculty. I can also help you understand the scholarly communication landscape. You know, what is a journal article? What does that process look like? If you want to submit something to the undergraduate research journal that, that Jonathan highlighted, you know, that's something I can explain to you how that works. How do we purchase materials? I mean, that's a whole different conversation, but I can, I can sort of show you under the hood there of how that works and how information has value and how it plays a place like Ohio State, we have significant funds to purchase this information. And I I can talk to you about cost and I can talk to you about, you know, author's rights and things like that. And, you know, that's really helpful for you to know, especially if you're going to go on to graduate school. Um, I can help you contact special collections. Um, so that includes rare books and manuscripts library, the Theater Research Institute, the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. Um, you may not realize the holdings um, that these uh, collections 
um, have for researchers. But what Lee was talking about, um, looking at some of these artifacts and they might help you regardless of what type of research you're doing or even if you're just interested. So these collections are available. They are not as accessible widely as our circulating collections, but it doesn't mean that they're closed off to you. You just would need to make the appointment and 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 go through a different process. But that does not mean that you are not invited and not welcome. And I can help you navigate that process. Um, I can also talk to you about librarianship as a career path if you're interested. So um, these are just a few things. I can also talk to you about pop culture, crime fiction, whatever you want. So feel free to reach out. Um, I love to talk about all those things. Uh, Karen talked about crime fiction and detective fiction. So I'm also another person. If you want to talk about Tana French with, we can do that. That's cool too. Um, I do have some resources that I gave um, to put on the ING source research resources page. So you can click that. I'm not going to kind of go out of the slide and mess around with that right now, but you can see that there are links to special collections, who to talk to. There are a lot of, there's a lot of information there, but just know that bottom line, you can contact me as a liaison to any of these things. So you can contact them directly if you feel comfortable, but if you just want to have a chat and decide which avenue is the best for you to pursue during your research, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I also have posted the English Studies Research Guide, which is sort of a curated website of some of our resources. It is not comprehensive, um, but it can be a good place to start, especially if you're taking a class in an area that you're not quite familiar with. There's um, a whole section on background resources. If you want to look up a particular theory or a particular era, um, this is a one way for you to do it. Um, and you know, in addition to asking your professors, but something that you can kind of do on your own. Um, and also, I want to talk about the Undergraduate Research Library Fellowship. Every summer, the library sponsors several fellowships along with the Undergraduate Research Office um, for students to do a 10-week research project and get a $4,000 stipend, and you would be mentored by one of the um, faculty librarians, and I've done several of these. Um, and they're wonderful. And I've used some of the, some of them, um, some of the students have gone on to expand their projects into undergraduate honors theses um, and independent studies. So that's sort of my thing right now. That's what I really love doing with the students um, who get the fellowships. I'm always trying to think of other ways that they can build on the research, the research they're doing uh, in the fellowship. So um, that's something we can talk about. Uh, it is too late to submit this year. In fact, I think the committee made their decisions yesterday. So I'm waiting to hear about those <laughs> for uh, the students that I supported this year. But you can talk to me about that. So there are opportunities um, to do a more in-depth research project under the guidance of a librarian. Um, and we can talk more about that. So I think I'll just leave it with that and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end, but um, you'll have this PDF and just as a reminder of, of the ways we can help you. Great, thank you so much, Jen. Um, I really appreciate hearing all about the resources and I really just wanna echo what she's saying about please ask questions. Research librarians are wizards. Um, so, so I'm gonna give you an example and don't actually do this to Jen, but I remember once in graduate school, I was doing a paper on Robinson Crusoe environmentalism and colonialism, and I was looking at this thing, this context about they'd had this, the British colonies had some problem with goats on this one island. So I literally reached out to our research librarian and I said, I know there was a problem with goats in the early 1700s in a British colony, but I need more information. It was a bonkers email. She managed to get me the documentation about this and what had happened that made this really great kind of texture and context to my argument about um, it, about Robinson Crusoe in this paper. And so I could never have found it by myself. That's not my era, anything like that. So please don't send Jen random questions about goats in the early 1700s, but it just goes to show like what kind of help they can offer in terms of research questions and what they do. So definitely um, use the research librarians as resources. They're fantastic. So thank you so much, Jen, for um, all of that. And again, I popped the PDF of that. Um, slide into the chat here. So uh, our next panelist is Mary Catherine Ramsey, who is a senior academic advisor in English. 
and she's going to discuss uh, more of the logistics about undergraduate studies um, theses, research distinction, and independent studies. So essentially, if you're if you hear all of this and you're like, this is exactly the kind of stuff I want to do now, how does that fit into my degree plans? Mary Catherine can definitely um, help give us some context for that. Mary Catherine has been an advisor for over 10 years at Ohio State, and she also serves as the director of the Young Writers Workshop, which is a summer program in creative writing for um, Columbus and I think expanding into Ohio's uh, high school students. Mary Catherine also holds an MFA in creative writing and an MA in comparative literature, so she is a writer and researcher herself, so she also has a background in that as well. So if you ask her kind of questions about this stuff, she's not, you know, going to be confused. She does it all herself as well. So thank you, Mary Catherine. All right, so a couple of caveats. Number one being I've been sick. So if I go off the rails, pull me back. And number two is I think they're doing work outside my house. So if you hear a lot of slamming, it's them and not my kids and the dogs. It could be the kids and the dogs too. Um, so my job really is more about the nuts and bolts. And like most of the work that I do as an advisor is sort of pulling back the curtain and demystifying the process of things, um, which I know I always found terrifying and still do sometimes. So I'm gonna share with you a couple of different resources this, um, I think I'll go over kind of quickly because I think we've touched on some of this a little bit, but I wrote up just a quick timeline for my own mind of people who want to do research and sort of where do you start. Obviously, as early as possible, you know, the day you walk onto Ohio State's campus is a good time to start thinking about it. Um, you all are here, which means you know that this is a thing, which is more than a lot of students do. So you're already beyond number one. You've moved along the board. Um, and just start sort of thinking about it, thinking about um, what are potential topics, and I'll give you some resources to look into that. Talking to your professors is huge. Um, talking to other students, you know, you're in a class that's discussion-based, and afterwards you go out for coffee and you start talking about things. That Those are all conversations that can help start the process um, of thinking about research. Um, Really important too is to start to think about the professors you'd like to work with. That can be a real mystery. Um, and I'll, find, I'll give you some resources in terms of trying to figure out what that means. Most of the time though, I would say students, that connection just happens because you're taking a class and something is brought up and you're like, that's so cool. I need to know more about that. And you go and you talk to the professor in office hours and then that whole relationship starts. That's usually the way it happens. Um, then, after you kind of have established that you want to do research, you know who the professor is you want to work with, you've talked to them about it, you've started to establish what that's going to look like, um, then, you, then you come to me for the paperwork. This is really pretty far down the road. Um, and I'll show you the paperwork and the application and all that stuff. Um, students are required to take at least four hours of what's called 4999, which is just research hours. Um, you can take up to 10. I would say most students in English do four to five. Um, they generally are not doing 10. Um, and then you apply for graduation, which is normally what you would do. Um, you defend, and I put what my nephew calls bunny ears around defend because every time I hear that word, I get terrified and I think they're gonna drag me to a courtroom in campus and like, there'll be a jury there. It's not like that. Um, a defense is really just an extended conversation with your thesis director and they ask questions and it's really actually an really cool opportunity to have a longer period of time to talk to them about your work. So don't let that word scare you, even though it scares me. And then just ensuring your final paperwork is submitted. So that's kind of the overview of, of how um, the sort of nuts and bolts work. And I'm going to show you and drop in the chat some resources. So this is a website that you would never find on your own. It's so deeply hidden. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat. This is actually the place where all of the research information is housed. This is where the deadlines are listed and they change these every term. So you can see students who are graduating um, next autumn, their application was due last in January. So they'll update this. So you can always kind of keep an eye on this. Um, it talks about the thesis requirements. There's a huge long list here of things you can look at, but I will say the two most important things are maybe three are um, you have to have at least a 3.0 in order to graduate with research distinction. You have to um, have 60 graded hours at Ohio State. So for transfer students, that can sometimes be an issue. Um, and you have to have submitted the paperwork on time, basically, um, in order to 
graduate with research distinction. Um, also on here is the application, which looks terrifying as all applications do. It's really not. I'm happy to walk through sort of filling out the application with you. It really is just asking questions about stuff you already know, your name, your email. Um, students have the option of doing research distinction in their own area of study, so English, which is what the vast majority do. But sometimes students will do research distinction in another area, so that's what this is all about. Um, so again, just basic questions. Um, this is about the courses. Now, this is the page where things start to get really scary. Um, it's just a huge box, and you're supposed to tell them what you're going to do. Um, you're even supposed to have a title, and I know that that itself can be weeks of just sobbing into coffee cups. Um, the good news is this is at the beginning of the process. Everyone understands that this is going to be reshaped and changed throughout. The title you had at the beginning probably won't be the title at the end. And the things that you thought you were going to learn through the process, not at all what you learned, not at all what you came to. And that's perfectly fine. The only point of this is to get you thinking about where you'd like to begin and put you in conversation with your professor about that. The office that receives these isn't going to go through it with a red pen and be like, oh, no, no, Chaucer, no, we're done. We've had two Chaucers this year. We're done. We're not doing that. Um, so don't get too freaked out about the big blank box. It, it definitely is nerve wracking. Um, and then at the end, it's just signatures. Um, you're going to have your thesis advisor. You're going to have me or Jameson, my colleague, sign, depending on what area that you're doing your research in. Um, and you're going to sign it. And then ship it off to Ed Quinn. So that's the kind of overview of the thesis. That link will take you to it so you can look at it more closely. Um, what I also love here is the knowledge bank. You can spend years in the knowledge bank. This is where all the theses go. So you can go and see all the stuff people have done um, in terms of, and, and it's wild. Like a lot of students don't realize a short story collection could be a thesis, many short story collections, um, but it's just a cool place to go. So if you go to the knowledge bank, you can take a look at all the different examples there um, of theses, theses that have gone on in the past. Um, the other thing I would show you that students sometimes don't realize exists is if you go to english.osu.edu and click on people, so one of the requirements of a thesis is that your professor has to be tenure track. For most students, they're like, do they wear a special patch? How am I supposed to know that's the case? Um, this is how you find out. You can go here and find out what their research areas are. You can go here to find out sort of where are they a graduate student, in which case they can't be the person um, who is directing your thesis, or are they someone who could direct your thesis. Now, this is also a conversation you can have with any professor or me or Katie or Jameson. But if you're like me and you just want to find out at 2 a.m., go to this website. So I am happy, like everyone else, to address any questions or if there's anything you're like, wait, I thought you for sure you would talk about blah, blah, blah. Let me know. Um, that is about, and let me just say this too, email me anytime, ramsey.240 at osu.edu. If I talk too fast and you're like, I have no idea anything you said, just email me, we can meet, we can talk. Um, I'm happy to pull back the curtain on any mystifying processes, whether they have to do with research or just college in general. Thank you so much, Mary Catherine. I think I want to just echo two things that she said. One is ask ask us, we're always happy to help. What Mary Catherine said about, you know, ask us any kind of questions about this, definitely do that. Two, I love your explanation of how research and like when you start, everything is proposed. And that means that it's always gonna be in revision. So much of research is revision, learning new things. And, and you're probably gonna end up, as Mary Catherine said, really far from where you started. Sometimes you don't, but to me, I think the best research projects are also ones where you start thinking you're gonna write about X and then you kind of end up in Y or maybe X point like 2.0 <laughs> and it tends to be a little bit different and so um, I really liked your explanation of that so thank you so much and finally um, our last speaker is going to talk about what it's like to be an undergraduate researcher so if you're like okay well everyone who just talked was super fancy and like I said all-star panel right um, so if you were like everyone's super fancy here how do I do this is this not to say that Rachel's not fancy 
I realized I talked myself into a hole there. So Rachel is fancy too, but I'm really excited to have somebody who actually was an undergraduate researcher. So with us today, we have Rachel Stewart, who is a current MAPHC student at Ohio State in English. Rachel also got her undergraduate degree here at Ohio State. She will discuss her experience with undergraduate research, um, which was, I think, pretty very cool. Her research interests are rooted in popular Victorian fiction and culture, particularly that of the horror genre. And she is especially interested in monstrosity and the figures that embody it, such as the vampire, ghost, or haunted house, and their evolving legacies from the 19th century to contemporary pop culture. Her undergraduate thesis, Defanging the Tradition, an Examination of the Psychic Vampire in Literature, was completed here at Ohio State, and it was recently awarded an honorable mention for the David O. France Thesis Award. So thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. Thank you so much for having me. I will attempt to share my screen and hope it works because I don't do it very often. All right. I believe this should be working. Okay. So let me go back to it's also a very short presentation. It's more just so that I don't make my mind go off in a million different directions, but undergraduate research, I did it. I did it as a senior thesis, so I'll be kind of talking about it through that angle. And I also did it through the literary history, literary research angle with Dr. Karen Winsett as my advisor. So everything kind of comes full circle. Um, so I also, like, like Mary Catherine said, your title changes so often. And so this was, this was going to be the title of my entire thesis. Then it just ended up being the title of one chapter, but I still thought it was clever. So I decided to put it on the presentation. But so the vampire of time and memory ended up being just the title of my first chapter of my project, which overall looks at vampires that don't suck blood and more deal with spiritual energy or life energy sucking. And so I had two chapters for it. One was the um, vampire of trauma, as I caused, called it, from Tana French's In the Woods. And then the second chapter dealt with a historical psychic vampire of Florence Marriott's The Blood of the Vampire. So it was kind of just briefly what I did with my undergraduate research. And then the big questions that I feel like encompass a lot of the experience, but also like everyone's been saying, if I don't cover something, totally happy to answer questions about it. I will ramble on about my research for days if people let me. So it's good to know that people don't let me because that would be a disaster. But why did I do it? Um, kind of echoing what people have been saying and that I will say is very true. There's kind of two prongs to undergraduate research that I see. One is the personal aspect of it, of why you should do it. It's just finding something that you're really passionate about and wanting to spend time looking at it. It's quite as simple as that. You just find something that you can't stop thinking about that kind of lives with you, lives within you. You go to bed, it's 3 a.m. and you just can't stop thinking about it. And you say, well, okay, well then maybe I just won't stop thinking about it and I'll do something with it. So that's kind of the personal fulfillment angle. It's total freedom, exploring something that maybe you didn't get to explore in class or you saw in class, but then kind of got washed over and you want to spend more time with. And then there's also the more professional angle of it. Uh, if you know that you want to go to graduate school, doing undergraduate research is a fantastic way to figure out if you actually want to go to graduate school because it's a little taste of what you'll be doing. And for me, it was incredibly helpful because it did confirm that I wanted to go to graduate school. And then here I am in graduate school. And um, it also really helps for your applications for graduate school because most likely you will end up using your thesis or part of your thesis as part of your graduate school application to show that you've already been doing research and you wanna continue doing it in graduate school. And you can kind of say, you know, I already have some experience with this. Here's what I'm interested in, you know, please, please let me in. And so also with that, kind of doing what you're passionate about helps you then on the grad school route of figuring out what you want to do in graduate school, because they'll ask you, you know, you can't just go for an English PhD and say, well, I like reading. And that's it. You can need to have a little bit more of a focus for that. And so a lot of the times doing your thesis can help you with that. It certainly helped me for that. I, you know, going into the second question of how did I choose this topic, I thought I was going to be doing something completely different in graduate school when I started my thesis. I thought I was going to be doing contemporary science fiction, horror genre studies, adaptation, something, which I, I kind of do now, but I'm now a Victorianist. And a lot of that came through my thesis of I was exploring, I knew that I wanted to do something about vampires. I knew that that was going to be kind of the general idea of my thesis, but I didn't exactly know specifically what I wanted to do. I thought I was going to do lesbian vampirism. Then I thought I was going to do the aesthetics of vampirism and how like the fangs are a whole thing. And then I just kind of settled with the blood of the vampire as this text that I couldn't stop thinking about. And I said, okay, 
what's the most interesting thing to me about the blood of the vampire? And it really just took me down a rabbit hole of Victorian popular fiction and Victorian popular culture. And I realized I'm kind of obsessed with this. I think I'm a Victorianist. And that really, really helped me figure out what I wanted to do in graduate school and figure out that I do still like, you know, contemporary science fiction and everything, but that is not, that wasn't where intellectually I was thriving as much. And so through, you know, many days and nights and many scrapped research paper ideas for the thesis, I managed to wiggle it down. But I think that's a good story to tell people because, you know, it seems like this big thing, the senior thesis, you know, whatever. And it is, but it's also super flexible. You can, it, it can change, your interests can change. As you do research, you may figure out, oh, you know, the scholarly conversation is over here, but I don't even agree with it. I want to try and move it somewhere else. And so that's also something that you can do. And that's kind of what I end up doing because through my chapter on Florence Marriott, I realized that people aren't really talking about her that much. Only within the past couple of years has there been any sort of interest in her. And it's really only been in Victorian circles. And I wanted to know more about her. I was not satisfied with the amount of research that was currently available to me digitally, but I knew, and this also, I will say, you can truly bother Mary Catherine, Katie, and Jen to no end because I did. I emailed them like every week, like, well, what, if, what about this particular thing that I want to know more about? Or what about this, uh, you know, the application says this, what if I want to do this? I felt bad, but I also was like, I'm just going to ask and I know that they'll have the answers. And they did. And so Jen was helping me look for more information about Florence Marriott because I was having a tough time. And we figured out that there was a Florence Marriott collection at the Yale Beinecke um, Rare Books and Manuscripts, you know, section of their library. And I said, wow, that's super cool. I'd love to go there. Just kind of thinking, you know, daydream, love to go there. I tell Karen about it. And Karen says, why don't you just go? And I said, well, I mean, I'd like to, but I can't just hop on a plane and go. Spring break's coming up, but you know, I can't just go. And then she said, actually you can because the department has undergraduate research money that you can apply for. And it's made for specifically for situations like this, which, you know, there's an archive that you are going to use to directly put in your thesis. You can apply for that money and there's no reason why you wouldn't get it because you're using it for exactly what it's supposed to be used for. And so I did it and, you know, spring break was coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I proposed, hey, can I go to Yale and go to this archive and use it for my thesis? And the department said, yeah, here's some money, go have fun. And it honestly was one of the best experiences of my life. It was incredible on both just a personal, you know, fulfillment level. And also I think it really, really, really made my research all the more stronger because there were so many things in the archive that were not digitized that I never would have had access to and just really fully fleshed out that chapter. And now also talking about what Professor Buell is saying, that chapter is something that I'm going to be working on this summer to flesh out even more and hopefully publish in an academic journal. So it all kind of comes together, all the pieces come together and it keeps being useful in both a professional and a personal manner. So that's kind of my, my journey. And also like Mary Catherine said, you know, I finished it, I defended it. The defense is nothing, it's a fun time. I had a great time at my defense. You just get to talk about it and ask questions about you know, your own paper and talk about things and just have a great time. Even, you know, even through Zoom, even through not the traditional defense, it was totally fine, not, not nerve wracking or anything of the sort. But yeah, I'm happy to answer any other questions about undergraduate research, the thesis, you know, specifically archival trips, applying to grants, whatever it may be. But thank you so much for having me and letting me do my spiel. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I think that that just kind of culminates everything that was said at this panel. Um, and yes, I think archival research is super fun. So if anyone has questions about that, please ask because it's just super fun. Anyways, um, so I'm also going to drop a few links in the chat right now. Um, I'm in, gonna invite questions. So if people have questions, again, please feel free to turn on your microphone and ask or drop them in the chat. But I'm also going to drop in a few links um, to some of our websites on our department. Um, one about just sort of general research, uh, things there in terms of writing theses. Um, that's our kind of main page for undergraduate research. I'm also dropping the awards page for English. And if you go to the near the bottom of that, you'll find the award that Rachel was talking about for undergraduate research grants. Um, you'll find that there. Those are accepted on a rolling basis. And this 
website fleshes out a little bit more steps to completing a thesis to talk a little bit more about the kind of um, uh, how you might think through them and what you'll be doing when you're working on a thesis. So if anyone has questions about that, let me know. And um, so those are just some resources for the department, but um, we would love to hear questions from those in the audience. So if anyone has questions, again, feel free right now. I'm gonna turn my mic off and be quiet and sit in the uncomfortable silence while you ask questions. I can jump in and ask a question here. Um, so I'm actually, I'm not an English major, I'm a statistics major, uh, English minor. Um, I, some of you all mentioned a few different applications or examples of when people in different disciplines were able to do some uh, cross-disciplinary work. Um, I was wondering if maybe you all could speak a little bit more to some of those examples and, um, I guess, what are some interesting ways, maybe in your specific fields that you have seen people applying different, you know, STEM uh, related uh, disciplines to your specific fields? Well, I, I guess I could start, um, since I, I did mention the one example of, of my student who's a double major. So she major in chemistry, major in um, English and, Kind of pursued those interests semi separately in the sense that you know she went and did her chemistry um, uh, thesis and then as she was working on that she was simultaneously talking to me working on the the accommodation of that research um, as a sort of a portfolio of writing projects um, but def but you know trying to bring these areas of expertise together and I know that's something that that the department overall is trying to do I mean you mentioned being a a, a stats uh, major or a math field major, but we now have that combined um, math and English degree, which just kind of got started in the last couple of years. So it's it's definitely, I think, a, a, a point of crossover. I know in my own work, I mean, I don't have a, a science background in the sense that I did not do a degree in chemistry, biology, physics as an undergraduate. I did an undergraduate degree in English, but my um, primary research interests are in the rhetoric of science, which means I study how scientists argue. Um, I study sci scientific visuals, um, scientific writing practices, discourse communities, things like that. So I think there's there's ways to, to bridge. It's helpful, I think, like if you wanted to, I, one of my colleagues from graduate school did his work uh, as, a, as a graduate student and his first book on uh, the rhetoric of mathematics, which people think, oh, there, how could there be rhetoric in math? It's the antithesis. Well, mathematicians have to argue too. Um, and so um, and he acted as his book was on statistics and how statistics play into biological arguments, particularly early in um, uh, as evolution was developing as a theory um, and different um, issues related to that. So there's, as I, I mentioned with WRL, there, if, if you have an interest, you can always find a, a rhetorical or writing uh, angle to it or slant to it. I can ask a question if that's okay. Um, I listened to like some of like the research uh, areas of specific studies. It sounds very time period based. What if the research that you're interested in is more regional based or culturally based, but not maybe to a specific time period? I guess I can just speak from experience a little bit in the way that even though in graduate school, you know, I'm kind of in my like 19th century hole or whatever, my actual thesis um, had two chapters and they were from completely different time periods, completely different places. My Florence Marriott chapter was 19th century British. And then my Tana French chapter was 21st century Irish, you know, Irish with also, even though it's Irish, it's also very popular in America. So there's, you know, transatlantic things going on there as well. But yeah, they were not, they were only linked together through kind of theoretical idea of vampirism. So the possibilities are really endless. You can do 
however you want to make your argument that they fit together, as long as you can make that, you know, work, I think it's totally fine. I did it. They really, I don't think anyone who would have seen the text I was working with would have thought that they could go together in any way, shape, or form, not time period, not place, not topic at all. So I have faith that you can make it work. I'm thinking back of on the theses that have been written over the last um, few years. I'm often on the um, thesis award um, judging committee. And I think many, possibly most of the thesis writers were bringing together um, different time periods. So um, I don't think at all there is necessarily a, um, a a, any kind of um, imperative that you stick with a, a particular time period. I mean, you can certainly, um, but one of the nice things about writing um, a thesis or engaging in research is that you can cross boundaries in ways that, you know, maybe aren't conventional. And that's one of the exciting things about it. Um, yeah. And in fact, it's a little bit, it's even more liberating than the kind of um, work you would be doing as a, as a professor or what have you, because you don't necessarily have to respect the boundaries of the fields, you can cross them. And you're at that liminal point as an undergraduate researcher where you have that space for transgressing, for boundary crossing, for reshaping fields. Um, and I think that is just really incredibly cool. And I, I want, I'll say, I think one of my very famous favorite theses that I've ever read um, was a thesis about some guy who was, um, who was looking at a passage from Beowulf, you know, old English epic. And um, he was talking about translating Beowulf and the um, choices that one makes and how as a, as a translator can, can completely alter the uh, nature of the poem. Um, and their interpretive choices. And so this guy was very erudite in his um, analysis of how these different modern translations of a single passage of Beowulf um, affected its meaning, gave us very, very different moments. And he knew Old English and it was very scholarly and it was very, very impressive, erudite. And then he said, well, and now let's look at Spanish. So he did the same thing with the Spanish, also very, very erudite. And oh, wow, he, he's bringing all of this linguistic knowledge to, to this project. And then he said, and then I tried my own um, hand at translating this passage in different literary forms. So he had like heroic couplets of that passage. And then he, ha he transformed that, that passage into a sonnet and into a ballad and into a uh, blank verse and, uh, and into a haiku, you know, a haiku, a ballad, a Beowulf, really seriously. And it was smart and totally unusual and transgressive and creative. And that's what you can do in an undergraduate thesis. Yes, that's amazing. Um, and, and I think to kind of bridge both what um, Richard and Jeffrey were saying, I think there are so many opportunities in undergraduate research for people to bring their unique skills to that. Um, so, and, and Jeffrey, another thing I wanted to mention, I'm not sure how prevalent this is um, here, what opportunities necessarily at Ohio State, but there's a lot of work in digital humanities that deals with statistical modeling. Um, and so there are many opportunities to do that. I would say um, one person you might look into taking a course with is John Jones in the English department. He has an undergraduate degree in math. Um, and I know that he works in these areas as well. And so I would definitely say that if this is something you're interested in, there definitely is the capability for doing that. Um, I, I have a friend who in my graduate program did um, an entirely digital 
edition of Ulysses, um, where people could crowdsource, um, you know, commentary. It was kind of like genius, but like for Ulysses, I'm probably butchering that. So if she ever hears this, then, you know, I'm in trouble. But uh, it was a really interesting project, but because she could code, it was something that she could do. So there's a lot of work um, to be done, I think, in humanities research and in English in particular, where bringing the kind of language skills, the coding skills, the statistical skills it, to bear in that means that you actually have, it, I think it's not so much the limitations of that, but it actually means you can expand the bounds of what can be done in really, really interesting ways to make for a unique project that is something, you know, only you could do in a certain way. And so I think that's really cool. Um, We've also had a student who did a thesis that was directing a play. And so I thought that was really interesting as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for exactly that type of work. Um, any other questions that we can address um, for you about undergraduate research in English? I don't have a question, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, if there aren't any other questions, and I would say too, in terms of asking questions, please feel free to email um, any, you know, email me. I'm happy to connect you with people. I think other people, you know, Mary and Catherine, I know can definitely um, connect you with people as well. Please reach out to us. Um, we're always happy to help. So no, you know, again, I just confess to emailing somebody about goats um, in the 1700s. So clearly I am open to all kinds of bonkers emails. So feel free to, you know, direct that at me if you don't feel comfortable doing it to other people. <laughs> Uh, but thank you so much for attending this session on undergraduate research. And thank you so, so much to our panelists for joining us today and for sharing their knowledge and expertise. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so have a great Friday afternoon, everybody, and have a great weekend. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you thank so you. much.